Hey guys, hi. <clears throat> All right, so today I'd like to share a message which God put in my heart this morning. And uh, it's simply that God is not a vending machine. Okay, that's it. That God is not a vending machine. Um, so many times in our lives, at one time or the other, most of us have had this relationship which, with God, which is exactly the kind of relationship you have with a vending machine. So now, if, if you think of your relationship with a vending machine, okay, it's, it's, it's like this. You only think about it, and you only ever go to it when you need something, okay? When we need something. When you get hungry, you need a snack or a drink or whatever, right? That's the only time we ever go to a vending machine. <clears throat> You go on campus, you go into a public building or whatever you go every day, you go to work. And most of these places have vending machines, right? Most days you just walk right past it. You don't give it a second look. You don't even look at it. You never think of it. You know, it never crosses your mind. You know, it's, it's not something you really care about that much until you need something. And that's the sad part that most of us at one point or the other, and I believe that right now I may be speaking to someone or some people who have that same relationship with God, with the Most High right now, the relationship that you would have with a vending machine. And um, <clears throat> this is sad because nowadays, especially in the times that we're living in, we need a firm, solid blazing relationship with God, more than ever, more than ever. Um, I could never overstress the importance of that in this hour, in this last hour, okay? There's many examples of how we, how, uh, we treat God, our relationship with God as a vending machine, but there, there's three, three major areas that God put on my heart, and I would like to share that with, with you, okay? Uh, the, the first thing is 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 something that's really escalating today and it's it's with the whole prosperity movement okay um you turn on your tv or radio you know or if you if you buy if you go to uh most of these bible christian so-called christian stores now they have all these tapes and 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 you watch tv all all of most of i'm not gonna say all of but most of mainstream broadcasted gospel on TV now, maybe nine out of ten, is all about prosperity. Okay, your your best life now, your best health now. Get this, get that. Do this to get that. And this is wrong. I'm not afraid, neither am I ashamed, to say that this is a doctrine from hell, from the pit of hell itself. This is what Christ warned us about in these last days, that many will fall away from the truth, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. This is exactly what's going on with all these so-called prosperity teachings. And, and, and sadly enough, we have many thousands, hundreds of thousands all around the world so-called Christians flocking to these churches, giving their money to these so-called preachers who are nothing but wolves in sheep clothing, hoping to get something in return. God is not the stock exchange. God is not, God is not a buy and sell transaction. God is not give me this, I'll give you that. He is the most high. I mean, show some respect, if not some understanding. And that's the sad reality. Because and, and, and why? So you ask yourself, these people are Christians. So how and why do they fall to these deceptions, to these deceptive spirits? We know that according to the Bible, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, it tells us that in the last days, people shall become, perilous times shall come, okay? And, and, and people will become lovers of pleasure 
love lovers of lovers of money, lovers of themselves, and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And this is exactly what's happening today. The Bible says that they will have a form of godliness, but they actually deny the power thereof. And that's exactly what's happening. The, all these so-called Christians, sadly enough, that they buy into these prosperity teachings and they choose to use God or treat God as a vending machine. And they use scriptures relating or pertaining to, you know, tithes and offerings and sow a seed. The, the, they love to use that one. Oh, you got to sow your seed or oh, sow a seed. You know, seed time and harvest time. It's a mess. I mean, don't get me wrong. Scripture is clear. As far as giving tithes, offerings, alms, and all that, Scripture is 100% clear on that. But <clears throat> these people take Scripture and they turn it around and they use it for their own profit while leading souls in the millions to hell. That's the sad truth. Because they use scriptures like Matthew, uh, what's that? Matthew 7, 7. They use scriptures like Matthew 7 and 7 that, that says, ask and you will receive. They use scriptures like that. And, and scriptures on tithing and scriptures on sowing and reaping. They use scriptures like that to deceive people. And, and listen, people are, people are most likely deceived when your heart is already in pointed in the wrong direction. What do I mean by that? If, if, if you're already in a place where you're coming to God because you're expecting something, if you're already in a place where your heart is more desiring of things more than it desires God, and then it's easier for you to fall into that trap. It is easier. But if you're in a place where your heart is searching more for God than just material things, it is almost impossible for you to fall to that scam. Okay? That's the sad truth. So, so they, they, they take scriptures like Matthew 7, 7, and, and they say, oh, you know, ask and you will receive, you know, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. And, and they translate that to mean and relate it just to material things. But they forget that scripture also says in, in Luke 12, 15, that Christ actually warns us in Luke 12, 15. Let's get that. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. It says, uh, let's get the King James Version here. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. You hear that? Scripture warns, uh, Christ warns of this, okay? Covetousness is greed. He says, be careful to not become greedy. Be careful. Because Christ knew that this time was going to come. This age was going to come. We, we live in an age that's so... Uh, Driven by material possession. We live in an age where a man or a woman is defined by what they have, what car they drive, what kind of a, a, a house or mansion they live in, how much they have in their bank account, what career they have. We live in an age that's literally defined by possessions. And this is exactly what Christ warned against. And now you have all these false preachers and prophets and, and, and those claiming to be God's people or God's shepherds coming with prosperity teachings and causing people to have a relationship with God, which is exactly like the relationship you have with a vending machine. You go to God because you think you can pay your tithes just to get something back. You go to God because you think you will pay your offerings to get forgiveness of sins or to get some blessing or to get healing or something. It is not true. That is not the God of the Bible. That is not the Most High. He doesn't function like that. He doesn't need your money. Get it straight. 
He doesn't need anything from you. The first thing that he wants to see is your heart. That you have a relationship from the purity of your heart. That you genuinely love and seek him. That you really want to know him. Not just what he can give to you. It's not just about what God can bless you with. It's about him. When you get to a place where you begin to know God deeply, and then you will understand exactly what I'm talking about because, listen, oh, the depths of the rich and the riches of the wisdom of God. When you get, when you begin to go deeper in the depths of knowing who God truly is, you begin to see and understand the riches of just that knowledge. And you know that he is more than gold. He is more than silver. He's not just a vending machine. You're not just going to go and give 10% and then get back, you know, whatever. Don't get me wrong. God blesses. Okay? He wants to bless you. But listen to what the Bible says that the blessings of the Most High make it rich. And he added no sorrow to it. Okay? God will bless you. But it's not some some ritual or, or some religious practice or some vending machine mentality that goes into that. No. So we need to come out of that. If, if, if you or anyone you know is, has fallen into that state where God has become just this object of provision in your life, where you turn to God just for prosperity, just for something you need or, you know, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't, you're, you're actually, you're missing out on who God really is and what he can really bless you with. Not just things in this world, but eternal things. Scripture says, where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. And Christ advises us, to, to store up treasures for ourselves for ourselves in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal and it can't be corrupted and we could never lose it. And it's everlasting. It never passes away. But we know that all these things that we fight for and we hustle to get while putting God on the back bench, all these things will pass away in the blink of an eye. Let's get um, James 4 verse 1 to 4. Okay, James 4, verse 1 to 4, it says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask you ask and do not receive, and, and, and let, me, let me stop here and pause for a second, and I'm going to introduce Matthew 7, 7 again, where it says, ask and you shall receive, okay? They, they use that scripture, but they forget to add this scripture to it. James 4, verse 3 says what? You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. You see that? Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with the Most High? You see that? This is what I'm talking about. God desires you to ask more for spiritual things than for physical things. And the more mature you are in God, the more mature, the closer you get to him, the more you will ask for the right things because you'll begin to see how vain this life is. Vanity upon vanity. All these things are vanity and passing away with the wind. The life of man is nothing but a puff of smoke. Here one second and gone the next. It's nothing. 
Christ uh, uh, teaches us uh, in, in, the, in the parable with, with where he, he, he made reference to, to considering the lilies of the, of the field, how, they're, how, they, they, how beautiful they are. And they grow and they're so glorious, but one moment they're here and the next they vanish. And, and he compared that to Solomon, right? Who was so powerful and, and had all this majesty. But even Solomon at his best was nothing compared to the lilies of the field. You see, life, this life that we so fight and kill and covet and are greedy for, it's nothing. So what's more important? What's most important is your relationship with the Most High. Don't settle for a vending machine relationship with God. You're missing out. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're sick or healthy, if you don't have a, a, a flourishing a blazing relationship with God. You're missing out. So don't don't if if don't if if you're going to a church, I'm gonna make a bold statement here. If you're going to a church whose pastor or pastors have sold out to the so-called prosperity teachings, quit. Get out. Find a real a real body, true worshipers of God. Okay, Bible says that uh, uh, the time will come when the real worshipers of God will worship Him in spirit and in truth. I don't care if you're going to a what 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 do they call them now? A mega church. You see all this, all these churches with thousands of people, and at the end of the day, not so not even up to maybe one percent of them has a true, genuine relationship with the Most High. It is a sad day that we're living in. So again, I make a bold statement. If you or anyone you know is part of any of the so-called prosperity churches, get out immediately for the sake of your soul. For the sake of your soul. I'm going to move on to the next topic here. As far as treating God as a vending machine. Daily. A lot of us do it daily, on a daily basis, okay? It may be in time of sickness. It may be in time of danger or trouble. Or for most of us, it's maybe just when you're going to bed at night. <laughs> There's some people that, you know, are scared of the night. Some people only think about God when they're going to sleep. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's sort of an hour of uncertainty. When you go to sleep, literally, when you go to sleep, it's like you die. Because you, you're not very conscious of so much until you wake up. And, and, and this is the power of God that's at work, that wakes you up. It's the power of God. When you sleep, it's, it's like, you know, it's, man, this is by design. But anyways, that's beside the point. The main point is, a lot of us, at one point or the other, in our daily living, we, we have a relationship with God, which is like a relationship with a vending machine. How can we just go all day or all week without spending time with God, without prayer, without worship, without spending some time to read scripture, to study, to show yourself approved, like scripture says. Scripture also says to be diligent, to show yourself approved before God. How can we be diligent in, in serving him or to show ourselves approved before him without, you know, Spending time with Him in prayer, in worship, in, in, in fellowship, in communion with Him and the saints. I, listen, sometimes it happens. Sometimes you have a crazy day, one of those crazy days where everything that could possibly go wrong, goes wrong. I understand that. But for the most part, we have no excuse. As ambassadors of Christ... We have no excuse to, to go a whole day without even thinking about God or, you know, trying to five, find even 10, 15 or 30 minutes to spend time with God. With Bible study or prayer, worship, you know, uh, singing hymns or, or psalms or, you know, if you have a relationship with someone that you love, you talk to them every day. If you have a, a husband, wife, fiance, whatever, you know, 
or even even apart from a, a romantic relationship just just think about just brother sister mom dad people you love in your life you you love to, you think about them all the time you talk to them all the time you email text facebook whatever but god himself the almighty some of us afford to go a whole day sometimes even a week or month or months without him and we say uh, maybe a flimsy prayer here and there and we think that it's okay it's not okay no it's not okay we can't treat god like that he desires to be close to us bible says if we draw close to him he will draw close to us but check it out second timothy 2 uh, chapter 2 verse 12b it says what if we deny him he will also deny us and listen for many of us Christians, when, when, when you hear that someone denies Christ, you, the first thought that maybe goes through your mind is you're thinking, oh, he's a pagan, or he's a Satanist, or he's an atheist, or whatever. Well, it's, it's not necessarily true. Because a lot of us profess to know God, but we deny him by our actions. And, and check it out. Our actions is not just what we do, but it's also what we fail to do. Right? So if, if you say you know God and you go for a whole day or a whole week without meditating or fellowshipping with him or having communion with him or praising him or worshipping him or praying to him or, or spending time in his word, are you not denying him? If you give more time to entertainment, you give more time to TV and, 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 and entertainment or video games or you give more time to worldly things or going out having fun. You give more time to pleasures, loving yourself, loving money, rather than loving God. Are you not denying Him? You don't have to be a, a self-proclaimed or a self-professed atheist or Satanist to show that you're denying God. No. You don't have to walk around with an upside, with, with an inverted cross on your, on your shirt to show that you're an antichrist or that you hate God. No. It shows because Bible says what that by their fruits, you will know them by their fruits. You will know them in what we do or what we don't do. So don't focus so much on, on don't focus so much in just what's done. No, also consider what's not being done. The things that we ought to do as, as people who ought to have a relationship with God. Because what? Why? He is our source of strength. He is our source of life. He is our source of, source of health. And yes, He is the one that provides for us. And God is so good and so gracious that even when, most times even when we forget Him, He still provides. He's just so gracious that way. But don't be surprised when one day you're going to wake up and you're in deep, deep trouble and you call out to him and he says, I don't know you. Don't be surprised if one day you fall sick with a terrible sickness and you call out to him and he says, I don't know you. Why? Because you've spent the major uh, part of your life denying him. And then you want to call on him just, just when you fall sick or just when you're in some trouble or just when you need something. No, it's not fair. God is not a vending machine. He is more than that. And it's time that we wake up and see God for who he really is. It's time that we wake up and pay him the due respect. It's time we wake up and realize that, hey, this is the most high we're talking about. He holds your breath in his hands. It's time we wake up and give him the due respect. It's time that we wake up and put God before family, put God before entertainment, put God before career, put God before money, put God before everything else that begins your day. Wake up in the morning and put God first. It's time that we put God in his rightful place in our lives. Because I'll tell you what, there is always some God on the throne of your heart. If it's not the most high, if it's not the almighty, then it's mammon. 
okay? Because like scripture says, we cannot serve two masters. You cannot, we cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot serve God and the world and money or lust or pleasures. No, that it's, it's one or the other. So that's the second aspect. The last aspect that I want to talk about as, as far as thinking we can treat God as a vending machine and get whatever we want from him whenever we want it by doing some religious or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, giving something to get something or performing some ritual, it will not work. This last aspect is the so-called uh, deathbed confession. This is another doctrine from the pit of hell itself. Okay. <clears throat> Many of us have probably heard this one time or the other, where uh, there's this doctrine that you can go on living your life just as you want, do whatever you want. If it feels good, do it. You know, do as thou wilt, which is a doctrine from hell. You can live your life the way you want. No accountability to anything. No second thoughts. Just get loose and get wild. <laughs> and do as you please. And then, at the end of your feeble days, at the end of this short, short life that we have in this place called Earth, which we're, we're all just passing away. It's but, it's but a moment, this life, compared to eternity. At the, end of your, at the end of your miserable days, in this fallen world, you turn around and confess your sins, and then God will just open his arms and just embrace you and welcome you into heaven, because God is just so loving and so caring. <laughs> this is the, I don't know if to call it stupid, or sad. I don't know if to call it, I don't know, but it is, it's, it's actually both sad and, and stupid, but it is a doctrine of demons. And, and, and let me say this, the people that, that hold onto this doctrine, they use the scripture of Christ and the two thieves that were crucified with him, right? And, 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 and because Christ said to the one that, you know, this very day you, you, you will be with me in paradise. They use that as a, a, a reference to, or, or an indicator to say, you know what? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I can just go on, you know, just doing this, doing that. And, 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 and at the very end, just, just call on Christ because the Bible says that he, he who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There's, there's this yearning in, in me to cry out like, 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 like scriptures where it says, Oh, you foolish, foolish Galatians who has bewitched you, who has bewitched you to fall away from the truth. That's, that's, that's what's, that's what's burning in my heart right now to say, you foolish, foolish people who or what has bewitched you to think that that could possibly ever be true now let me say this yes the scripture where christ told this thief that today this very day you'll be with me in paradise that was true why because listen the guy had, had probably most never he never knew of christ this was most likely the first time he ever got preached to and most importantly, most importantly, he was genuine, okay? He sincerely went through repentance, okay? He truly repented of his sin. He was truly sorry, and he was grieved and broken over his sin, and he believed in the Savior. That's why he was saved, and the other thief was not. And listen, again, most importantly, he never went through his life with, with a plan to cheat God. <laughs> you see what I mean? He never, he never went through his life with some agenda, with some plan B. Like, you know, I'm just going to do all this. I'm just going to go and be a thief. And then, you know, when I'm caught and when I'm about to die, because trust me, these thieves, they, they knew the punishment that came with that. I mean, nowadays, if, if they catch you stealing, you go to jail. You know, you go to jail for a while, you know, you could make bail or something, you could, you could get out. 
But back then they knew that as a thief, the punishment was capital punishment. You die. They knew that. So so he didn't go about his life planning that, oh, I'm just going to keep, keep on stealing. And when I'm caught, I'll confess before I die. No, he didn't even know Christ. When he was beside Christ on the cross, that was the first time he ever knew of the Savior. And he accepted him. So, if, 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 people, are go, if, if people go about their lives today, and you think you can do as you please, and, and you make it a plan that at the end of your miserable days, you'll call on God, because scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me remind you that scripture also says, scripture also says that not all everyone who calls, who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall be saved. Again, I'm going to repeat that. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall be saved, but them that do the will of my Father. So here's the thing with scripture. You can't just take one part of it and run with it. You can't take just one part of scripture and use it as a basis for your whole life because because scripture ought to be precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Okay, so that's not going to fly. Let's get Galatians chapter 6. Verse 7 to 9, it says what? Galatians 6, verse 7 says, uh, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to to please their flesh, from the flesh, will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit, will reap eternal life. Okay? So, that that doctrine of 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 thinking you can do whatever you want and then at the end of the, your days you just call on the name of Jesus and and God's going to just welcome you into heaven you're 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 living in a delusion a strong delusion like the bible says you're deceiving yourself it's time you snap out of that because bible says what you cannot mock God. You cannot deceive God. You cannot cheat Him. You will reap as you sow. That's it. So those, and that's it. Overall, like I said, there's many points, but these are the three main things that God put on my heart today of just Having a relationship with God, which is really false. It's just vague. It's just, it's just, there's no subst- substance to it. There ought to be some substance to your relationship and to our relationship with God. Your relationship with God shouldn't just be a religious thing. It's something you just say or something you, you, you put on a show or something that's just meant for Sunday. It's, an, it's a walk. It's a walk. That's why there's a broad way and there's a narrow way. When you truly, when you come to God and you truly repent of your sins and you choose to walk with the Savior, you're on that narrow path. But if you come to Christ or you deceive yourself and, and you're thinking that you're in Christ and you're, you're okay with God and, and you're walking on the broad way, you're walking into hell. The end of that way is destruction. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. That's why we ought to check these things. We ought to evaluate ourselves every now and then. This is why we need times of meditation, times of quiet, okay? Where you go, you go to a quiet place, you you go to your mountain, okay? You go into your closet, you lock the door, put your cell phones away, put your tablets and and your laptops and your Wi-Fi away. Put your everything away and give God a moment. Give God some time to to fellowship with you, to to tell you something, to teach you something, to discipline you, to warn you of something. Give God that time. Put away everything. Have a relationship with Him. Relationship that has flesh and bones, not just 
air. Put some substance on your relationship with God. Let it stand when it's tested. So many of us profess to have a relationship with God, but in the day of testing, we fall away like a tree that has no root. And how can you be rooted in God if you don't spend time with Him? How can you be rooted in God if you don't abide with Him? How is that possible? So I'm going to ask you today, you listening to this, what is your relationship with God? Can it stand a trial? Can it stand a testing? Can it stand the great tribulation that's about to come on the whole world? Can it stand persecution? Or is it just talk? Is it just a show that you're putting on? When you search deep inside your heart, when you search your conscience, when no one else is even pointing a finger at you, if you point a finger to yourself and you search the depths of your heart, what do you find in there? What or who is on the throne of your heart? Is it God or is it money? Or is it your career? Or is it some relationship you have? Who has your heart more? Who has your heart more? And what's your future? Are you headed to the pearly city? Or are you headed to the torment of everlasting flames? How do you know that your salvation is sure? How do you know that Christ will not tell you that I don't know you? How do you know that you're not one of those who, even though you seem to be saying, Lord, 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 even though you seem to have an image of, of Christ, an image of a Christian, how do you know that you're not living a lie? Have you tested yourself? And has the Spirit confirmed in your heart that it is well with your soul? Test yourself. Search deep to the darkest parts of your heart and cry out to God and say, Father, if you find any sin in me, Uproot. Ask God to search your life, to turn you upside down, to bring you to your knees, to crush you under the grievance of your sin and your wretchedness and wickedness and dirt and filth, and cleanse you with the blood of Christ again, and give you a new heart that truly seeks God more than it seeks the things of this life. For Bible says that don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Have you become a friend with the world? Do you seek and lust after the things of the world more than you desire God? Do you seek to go pay money and go to the movies more than you seek to go aside and spend some time with God? Search yourself. Because at the end of the day, the truth lies within you. And listen, scripture says your sins, your sins will search you out. Your sins will find you out. So this is the day when we wake up and we stand for God and we refuse to have a relationship with God, which is the relationship that you would have with the vending machine. This is the day that we must stand and seek God and prove that we are on His side. Not just in word, but in deed. Not just in word, but in spirit and in truth. Okay. So once again, may the blessings of the Most High be on you all. And remember, as always, never stop hungering and thirsting for God. Shalom.